All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started because we uh, want to hear from you all at Testing. the end to, to help share as well. So I have a clipboard going around the room. If you'd like to uh, register your, for yourself for a giveaway in this session, where I'm doing a giveaway of my new book, Just For You, A Daily Self-Care Journal. So welcome everybody. I'm Elizabeth Miller from Atlanta, Georgia, and Happy Healthy Caregiver is my business. And this is my wonderful, awesome sister Susie, who is the current primary caregiver for our mother. I'm Susie Morrell. I live in um, Hubbard Lake, Michigan, which is in northern Michigan. And um, I am an artist and oil painter, as well as full-time caregiver to our mother and um, a brother with a mental disability. So. So you all are in the right place today. Well, you're in the right place for number one because you're at this conference. So kudos to you all for, for joining the National Caregiving Conference. How many of you all are coming back from last year? Woohoo! hoo and, how, and then the, the rest of you are all new. That's amazing. Perfect, perfect. Well, you're in the right place today. We're going to be talking about sharing the care and really what's worked for our family as far as dividing up the caregiving responsibilities. So I uh, hope that this is... You're, you're in the right place today if you're just tired of doing it all by yourself or you feel like you're doing it all by yourself. You want to learn how to better communicate and collaborate with your family members, and you want to help protect those relationships. And you want them to be well distributed through your family so that everybody's learning the amazing things you can learn from caregiving. We don't want to uh, deprive anyone else of those awesome learning experiences. So, and ultimately, we just want to be happier. The, we're living our lives today, so we want to be happy and healthy caregivers. So we're going to be talking, Susie and I, and, and Susie mentioned she's an oil painter. So that's one of, one of my favorites of hers. That's a poppies. Uh, and like I said, we have some information that you can grab at the end. Of course, in the app, there's also resources there. But we're going to be talking about how you can better communicate with family, how you can approach those difficult conversations with your family, how to manage your expectations so that everybody's on a level playing field, and what I think sometimes that we feel like um, is one of our secret sauce to success is just finding the humor. Is You can't make this shit up, frankly. So um, <laughs> finding the humor in unexpected places, how to share the responsibilities, organizing so you don't lose your sanity and you can maintain the status quo. Both Susie and I, I think, are pretty much maybe ninjas with our time uh, is one of our strengths and then just really protecting the relationship so we we like each other a lot so um, and if you want to uh, get a real taste of that come to our dining around tomorrow night and you can um, have dinner Italian dinner with us so we're both going to introduce ourselves a little bit so um, I'm Elizabeth and we are what we have six kids in our family mm-hmm we're the Behe Bunch instead of the Brady Bunch. And I guess you could say, I'm Jan. And that's Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> so I live outside Atlanta in Marietta, Georgia. I've been married 22 years. My husband was also a primary caregiver. And we have two active, awesome teenagers. One of them's a freshman at Alabama, Roll Tide. And my other one's trying to figure it out. He's a junior in high school. I work full time, so last year at this time I was in IT. Uh, I recently got promoted uh, back in the spring, so now I'm on the corporate strategy team leading a program management office for a, a, retail, a large retail company. So working and caregiving is something I can also speak a lot about. I, I'm a person, I'm not just a caregiver, and so I've got a lot of hobbies. I like to read, I love to write, I love to spotlight on other people's stories um, through the podcast, and I really like taking new adventures. And so my, my day job helps fund some amazing traveling and trips that we can do as a family. And so like I mentioned, I'm the founder of happyhealthycaregiver.com, and it, it's uh, about three and a half years ago. So, And then, like I said, this is my awesome sister Susie. Susie. I am Susie Morrell. Um, I live in Hubbard Lake, Michigan, as I mentioned. I am the mother of four amazing adults, three of which are at Penn State. We are. And one who has graduated, my older son. Um, so I was a full-time mother for, well, I still am a full-time mother, but for 24 years. Um, and then life took some changes, and I became primary caregiver for 
um, our chronically ill mother who is currently in the last two weeks uh, in hospice care, more for pain management than terminally ill right now, but um, that's been a big change. Um, and I also care for my developmentally disabled brother who is 55 and is also currently living with us. Um, I um, started a, my painting studio um, life about in 2008. I started doing my blog and posting my paintings online and um, doing that, which has given me an incredible um, meditative outlet for the caregiving round-the-clock care life that I have. I love living at the lake. Um, I love studio creation time and, of course, love time with my children and my family. Um, and my studio is at the lake. And so that's a little bit about me. Those are my children. So as she alluded to, both of us have alluded to, we, I don't know when we actually started caregiving because we can't, like, pinpoint it it was Snuck just up a, on us, like a little mudslide um but it would it definitely ramped up in the last several years and so first it, this may sound familiar to you it was just intermittent requests from our parents we would get these emails and phone calls we need help we need you know and they live six hours away from us our parents were retired in amelia island florida and we were all spread out. So I mentioned we have six kids in our family. I'm in the Atlanta area. I've got two brothers in the Atlanta area. And then my sister at the time was in Pennsylvania. We have a younger sister, Annie, who's in the Washington, D.C. area. And we have a brother who's developmentally disabled who kind of flip-flops a little bit between Georgia and Michigan. Currently, he's in Michigan. And so it started out with intermittent requests and then Really, we tried even having interventions with our parents, like literally writing letters of, hey, we want you to move closer to us. This is, you know, this is, we feel this is a mistake type of thing. And then it, they basically said, stop it. You know, we're aging in place and y'all just need to get over this. This is what we're doing. We're going to live here till we die, which meant we were going to be impacted by that. Um, in a big way. And my dad was the healthier of the two of them. We would call 2014 our spiral year, where things just started spiraling out of control. Our mom got sick in the spring, and really we felt like she was intubated. There was a lot of issues there. She was, as I said, the, the, the least healthy of the two. And we really thought we were going to lose our mom, frankly. And but wasn't really feeling unexpected to us, I think we could say. But what happened is mom got better. She went through a rehab facility in that year. She came home to their retirement home in Florida, and then my dad got sick. So what often happens when with spouses, elderly spouses like that, is one, my dad was taking care of my developmentally disabled brother, our mom, and so he had an infection, sepsis. It started, you know, had some issues with his heart before that. His heart, his lungs, and kidney couldn't all cooperate, frankly. And so we had some experience with the hospice facility. Uh, the last week of his life, he died within a month. So it was just completely took us for a loop. So we celebrated dad's life. That was really important to us that we celebrate his life in a big way. Uh, and so that was a unique experience that maybe we could talk about in a future conference yeah. topic. And we've moved mom four times in four years. Yeah, like just to take a pause and step back for what you said earlier, their life was going from Michigan to Florida, Michigan to Florida, and it was all working quite well. But when Elizabeth mentioned the intervention, um, we could see the um, frequency of them asking us to come down for different things. Someone would get sick. The loving children that we are, we'd come to their rescue. All of us had different, were at different points in our life. I was a stay-at-home mom, so I'd get called on, well, you aren't working, you can come away. So I would fly down. That There was an impact on my family for that. Elizabeth, Tim, and the others that were in Atlanta would um, weekend care. We'd try to overlap by one day to just pass the notebook and everything. And in those conversations, we would say there's a lot going on here with managing two homes and doing everything that's going on here. But again, uh, I saw a book, and I don't know who actually has it out there, but how to plan for your care. Uh, we were trying to anticipate that with them, but it's a very, very hard dis discussion to have. Some of you may have had those discussions. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so then our spiral year came, and there we were with two homes and actually a, a third property. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
we lost our father and then I'll let you take decisions yes. had to be made quickly because he was actually the caregiver for our mother who was using a walker at the time, had some challenges with movement and our brother who um, is quite independent but needs a lot yeah, of assistance with life skills. Tom so, is, yeah. the, there's Tom there. Uh, so we moved mom in four times in four years, and I think what makes Susie and I a, have a unique perspective on things is that we have both been in the position of long, long distance caregiver and primary caregiver. So first, I was the primary caregiver for mom when we moved her to Atlanta. They had lived in Atlanta before. We figured I had two brothers there, myself. We could just tag team it better. The weather's better. All these things made it so that we felt like Atlanta was the right choice. They had doctors there from the past. So we started with that. I um, have a different nurturing gene than Susie, so I think that we can, you know, I, I knew I couldn't take care of her in my house, frankly, also because I have a full-time job where my kids were in their stage of life, and so we went with the assisted living route, and we moved mom twice in years to try to find the right fit for assisted living. I will say that we didn't find that to be a fit in our situation a little bit because, as I like to phrase it, mom doesn't meet us halfway sometimes. Um, I don't know if you can relate to that. So then Susie had a life change, and well, we transitioned the care. Right. She um, was at the highest level of care in the assisted living she was in. Elizabeth did an excellent job. I have to say the first care facility she was in was the nicest. It's like a country club. Country club in Atlanta. It had so many wonderful opportunities and um, events going on there, but she just chose to not take advantage of them. And, and the care that she needed was at a very high level. In fact, she was even asking you to call. We were You found someone at the very end to come in for a few hours even during the week. So not, we only, not only are you, you know, financially, like, just draining, um, then she was... So anyway, long story short there, throughout my life change, um, I was married for 24 years, um, went through a divorce, found myself in my home with my children, my youngest... Um, were seniors in high school, and I promised them I was going to keep the home and everything going until they graduated. And all of that was, you know, on top of losing dad, just like almost more than I look back now, like how did we manage it only through the love and the sharing of the care through all the siblings. So while I was waiting for my boys to um, get through their senior year, um, I was alone in the house, and I found myself thinking, listening, talking on the phone to mom, trying to support long distance, listening to her crying, I'm not happy here. So I said, you know what, mom, why don't you move in with me? Why don't you come up here? I'm home. I'm still trying to do these renovation projects to get ready to sell the house. I can care for you here. We can be buddies, you know, it'll all. And Tom actually came with mom as well. So I have to say, some people are like, wow, that's a lot to take on. But honestly, through uh, the emotional part I was going through with the divorce and everything, I think it gave me a reason to get up every day and to, you know, caring for mom. She helped me as much as I helped her. That's what I tell her through all that. So, Which made so. me feel better that she, I think she actually believes says, believes that when she says it. <laughs> because when I, feeling yeah. like I what I was doing is I was handing her this huge cement boulder of like, Oh my gosh, you are crazy for taking this, you know? Yeah. Um, and if you have heard of my podcast, you might have heard the caregiver jar. And so the caregiver jar was like my little way of like yeah, giving but, a little bit of me in your ear. But you were very organized with like her medical thing. So, you know, yeah, with that change, as you all know, becomes a whole impact of now new doctors, new, um, you know, changing Medicare, changing addresses, the car, rich, all that. That yeah. I wasn't anticipating, but we got through that. So we, you were very organized, so that, that helped. Thank you. So we, uh, we've mentioned we have a middle brother who has developmental disabilities, and we have both cared for our mother-in-laws. So we had a little bit of taste of that, too. So I think for me that my husband is primary caregiver. His mom had lung cancer, so that we were overlapping with that for four years. That was happening at the same, same time. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we both had a taste of long-distance caregiving. And one of our things that we do that's funny is we'd have this thing called sister power. We have three. So, There's a third sister who we were trying yeah. to get to come. You can say a little bit about her. She works in D.C. and has uh, in the healthcare yeah. industry. She does a lot of advocacy for yep. different different things, but okay. uh, just wasn't at a place where she could 
she yeah. could get away, but she's here in spirit. She's part of that sister power. So a question for you all is how many people does it take to care for one care recipient? <laughs> yeah, if you answered that, that's right. Anything greater than one, I think, is, is definitely what I want to instill in, in this group here today. So uh, we can't do this alone. You know, we can do hard things, but we don't need to do them alone mm -hmm. is one of my favorite phrases. And uh, how many of you do feel like you're doing things alone right now? I'm just curious. Okay. Can we just ask how many in the group are caregivers currently? Okay. Yeah, good deal. So you might, have been, you might have tried asking for help. Maybe you felt like you've tried before and it just wasn't well received. Could be for any one of these reasons that you didn't get any response, crickets. You um, <laughs> perceived that, you know, so-and-so is too busy, you know, they're working, they can't handle anymore. We, we make assumptions about people. Um, we assume they can't handle the task. They're not going to do it as well as you are. They might not. And we feel like maybe it's a sign of weakness if we're asking for help on, for ourselves. Or we've been asked by our care recipient not to involve other people. They don't do it as well as you do. You know, I need, I need you to do it. So all of those things, I think, are, are reasons why you might be reluctant to ask for help. But how's that working for you, maybe? You know, so if it's, you know, it, it's too much work for one person. And so something's got to change because you know the definition of insanity, doing it the same way over and over again and expecting different results. And so you really have to, to, to put yourself in a thing and say, something's got to give here and, and we need a mind, mindset shift. So I love this. I found, I, I, I find all this good stuff online. Um, but disappointment equals expectation over reality. You're going to be disappointed when that happens. But with just one little flip to this equation, you can get to happiness. But happiness is reality over expectation. So really having, and, and what that says is having communication, having those conversations with your family can get you to make this shift. So it's a team effort. Uh, so we're at a point now where, and I think the point we wanted to get across to you is like, this is a fluid thing. You know, right now, I'm the long distance caregiver. She's the primary caregiver. That may not work forever. We're at a point now where things are kind of shifting. Do you want to mm -hmm. talk about that? Yes, as I think I touched on a little bit um, where, um, so uh, the hospice came where she just was having a lot of pain in an ankle. She has lots of aches and pains. We went to the ER because I thought the way she could hardly walk on it, maybe she broke or tore something. So we go to the ER. Um, actually, we started with the podiatrist, x-rays, found nothing there. A week later, the ER, x-rays, um, MRI, nothing there. She just has pain. We ended up staying overnight in the hospital, and the, one of the doctors came up and just, I guess with the new laws now, with um, the opioid and pain medication, that doctors are only allowed to prescribe three days for pain management, and she said, you'll be right back here next week if you can't walk on your ankle. So uh, she has other chronic disease. I, I should talk she's about that. She's a cocktail. This she is part of the humor a, part. So, so she's a cocktail of stuff. Yeah, she's a <laughs> diabetic, COPD. Um, sleep she has apnea, a, a sleep apnea, and uh, congestive heart failure. So, um, oh, and morbid obesity and was, mobility issues. And yeah, morbidly obese. She was a smoker for quite a few years. She grew up in the generation where smoking was quite popular, and she, you know, for many many years. So um, all these things, anyway, led to um, so the ER visit. The doctor telling us, I think hospice is the best. And I didn't realize this, but hospice is becoming like our pain managers now because they can prescribe and manage the, the pain. So she came home, and um, th with that, um, if any of you have any or have experienced hospice, I can have one aid for one hour, five days a week, and that helps with personal care. And it depends on the area you live in, uh, how many volunteers they have. Sometimes you can get uh, meal prep and things like that, cleaning in where I am in remote northern Michigan, the best I'm getting right now is a one day a week, an aide for one hour. The nurse comes twice a week. Um, there is a chaplain that will come once a month. There is a social worker that will come once a month. Um, and so then I also learned that I would get five days of respite care now in my 24-7. 
And I was like, woohoo. Sounds five amazing, days. Yeah. right? So what's coming da, da, up in da. October? Yeah. Sister Weekend. Yeah. We take annually our three sisters. We always get away for a few days over a long weekend. So I was saving my respite, my first respite care for that. And I thought, and we talked about it. The nurse talked about it. Mom was hesitant. She doesn't like anyone other than the people that are around her to care for her. But she agreed to it. So we did the five days of respite. And they prefer more than two days because of all the planning and the medication turnovers with the nurses and everything. So we said, let's, let's try it. She was on board. And I have to say, when, we, when I got back, um, it wasn't a good fit for us. So um, not that the care facility was not above par. It was just her ups and downs. Um, as you know, I mean, they have, they have to move through patients. They get so much time. They have to administer meds. They have a big job and, a, a, you know, a job that requires um, administering medications, doing different things for each patient. So because they had to get her up and down so fast, she was sore. It, she was more achy and sore when she came home than when she went in. We had a setback, so it caused me to take her back to the ER. She had had surgery about eight years ago on a shoulder that they were pulling on. I thought they had done more damage. She couldn't even lift her arm. I found her, couldn't get her out of bed, had to call um, emergency for just a lift assist. Um, so we took her back to the ER. There was no damage in the, sh the shoulder, but it required us to bring her back home now with the hospital bed in the main living room. So that's the situation I'm in right now. And yeah. it's, it's full time now it, where she could get up and down during the night. Now she needs assistance. So I so am we're at this, up this and down. bridge. Yeah. This, t this now we've, it's back to, you know, one, again, one person is trying to do the care. It's not possible. Yeah. Susie's getting broken sleep at night. So we're partly in our nooks and crannies of the conference <laughs> brainstorming. I had a great night's sleep last night, by yes. the way. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. So we, we reflect back on what's been working for us, and we've broken it down into five steps to what we call sharing the care. So the first one is to identify, highlight, prepare, meet, and touch base. And we're going to break each of these down, these five, five different steps for you all. So identifying the current task. So when you start caregiving, you had a life before caregiving. And it was probably super full. Your plate was full with lots of things. And then caregiving comes on as like, you're getting going back for a second helping of something and you haven't even finished your first helping yet. Like <laughs> it just keeps layering on and on and on. So when I work as a certified caregiving consultant with, with my clients, what I do is I really try to understand how they're currently spending their time because in order to find the time for their self care, which is what I'm super passionate about, you've got to figure out how, where you're going to squeeze this part in. And so before you can even tackle the, camp, the caregiving responsibilities, you have to tackle the family responsibilities. So in my nuclear family, as I mentioned, my husband has, was primary caregiver for his mom who was in Atlanta. Um, and I was caregiving for my mom. I have a full-time job. He has a full-time job. We've got some kids that got a lot going on. And so I have a worksheet. Um, and so this is, I shared this in the resources so that you have this information. In fact, I think the whole PowerPoint is in there, frankly. Um, but that is the short link to get to it. But what it is, is this is a sample of it. I brainstormed every single thing that anyone had to do in order to make our homework and our life work. And this is just a sample of those things. And then what, what happened then is that we defi define who is going to own it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that my husband does the lawn work, but he owns getting it done. Um, he does own trash, or my son owns trash. You know, my daughter was home at the time. So everybody's name went in here of who, who's owning what. And the nice thing about that then is that you're parking that traffic in your head and you don't have to worry about it anymore because somebody's working on that and taking something off of your plate so that you have time to put some of the caregiving portion on your plate. So that is super important. And then you can layer on the caregiving responsibilities. So similar to the family responsibilities worksheet, this is the one for caregiving responsibilities. Brainstorming everything that we could possibly think about of what we had to do to tackle the caregiving responsibilities. And so here's a sample of that. You know, administering medication, doing the laundry, changing the sheets, computer and phone setup issues, auto maintenance for the care -y, you know, they have all of their, their whole life of stuff. Um, and their personal care, so, and then coordinating a lot of those things. 
So that's step one was identifying and really figuring out. And then it's highlighting the candidates for each task reassignment. If you do this initially, you might see your name like the whole way down the person list. <laughs> Unacceptable. So you didn't get anything out of this session if you put your name in that thing. So shame on you. Um, but we've got to highlight the candidates for task reassignment. And so here's the thing. You want to ask yourself, do I want to do this? I mean, there are things that we actually like to do. I know, Patrick, you love technology. So you should probably put your name on the technology. Gail, you, own, you love self-care. So you would want to go in and maybe do some stretching and, and things like that. So to figure out what the things are that you really want to do and put your name on that. Ask yourself, am I only the only person? Well, you know, Susie is the only person right now to do a lot of it because she's the one that's physically present. And so that limits the things that she can get off of her plate are the things that you don't have to be physically present to do. And I'm learning to be a better delegator. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like, yeah, that letting things go is, is not easy for me. You want it done. I love one of Elizabeth's phrases, done is better than perfect. perfect. Yeah, <laughs> so. done is better than perfect. Could it be done from a, from a distance? Maybe put a little thing, you know, could this task be done from a distance? Some things, you know, do you have to pay the bills? <laughs> No, someone can pay the bills for you. They can change the addresses, have the bills go right there. You can pay a million things online, if not everything. That was something that we did for a while. So when we first um, did our divide and conquer and share the care, when mom first came to Atlanta, uh, I took on a lot in the beginning. You were on site, on site care. On care-care. site. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I had to be there for her ther grief therapy and be her friend because she was isolated and feeling lonely. I did the grocery shopping. She wanted her little snacks and things in there. Um, and then uh, Susie did the, the Tom, what you did. Uh, so um, because they had the second home that we had to deal with after my father passed away, um, there's actually two properties up there. I took on that because I was in the north and was making trips back and forth. And there were just you know ongoing maintenance things that have to happen. It's a lake house. Docks have to come in. Boats have to come in. Things need to be shut down. I managed that, and Annie, our third sister, was. Well, you also managed Tom. Tom oh, and Tom, yes. Yeah. So Tom came with me. He was actually. Tom's paperwork, too. With me prior. I managed his health care and. Um, yeah. SSDI, he has Social Security Disability. Yes, yes. And he was living with me, and I was trying to run him to and from the. the we signed him up for the Planet Fitness. I was, you know, trying to get him. He's. Uh, Large. And, yeah. <laughs> I did not say. Anyway, and then Annie, our third sister's in D.C., she took on the financial bit like we did. We changed all the addresses, all the bills, all the banking. She said, I can handle that. And so they might be wondering where the boys are in so all this. So the boys, um, so we had a couple boys in Atlanta. Uh, yeah. As I mentioned, I have no qualms saying I was the primary caregiver in Atlanta. Proud to have said that. However, <laughs> there were things that the, the boys did. We've got one brother that is... Um, you know the brother or the sister, you might have one, really just doesn't step up at all. And when they do, they might make things worse. Um, we have one of those. So we, we need to drink at the dine around and tell you more of that. But um, we also have a brother that's awesome. Our yeah. brother Tim mm -hmm. in Atlanta is awesome. However, he doesn't um, uh, see you. It, he's awesome when you tell him exactly what you need him to do. Yeah, he's perfect for that list. We, if we found something to put him in, he, he would get it done. And he's so willing to help. He just doesn't have the foresight to know what to do. So those lists mm -hmm. are amazingly helpful. They really are. You could highlight them, like give everybody a color and then pass them out to the family. And then they know. And then if something falls through the cracks, you know, you can, you just know who to call. You have a like you just said earlier, it's not that they have to do it. They're just responsible for helping to get it done. Even if it's exactly delegating it again to a further person out, a so caregiver. That's, that's how we managed it the first couple years is by dividing up all of those responsibilities. Now, honestly, now that Susie's mom's full-time caregiver, she did um, absorb a lot of those things. But we are still doing things from a distance uh, that we can help with. And we've also found things that we can outsource and someone else can do them for us. So here are some of those long distance support things. So there's Susie with the with the caregiver jar. When I said you're crazy, here I you go. I love that caregiver jar. If no one's seen it on Elizabeth's website, it's great. Every morning I pick out a motivational quote. I love it. So it was hard for me, you know, being the long distance caregiver after being mom's primary caregiver. I just felt like I wasn't, you know, doing as much as I could do. So here are the things that I'm tr that I'm doing as a long distance caregiver that that are important, frankly. 
So calling mom regularly. So this is my favorite. If you follow my Instagram stories, I always like to include mom's FaceTime um, in the right-hand corner. That's our FaceTime because she just can't seem to get her whole face <laughs> in the screen. And so I know the you, iPad is the most amazing thing, though. If any of you are, if, if any of the people you care for can manage an iPad, it keeps her so connected through FaceTime. But that is a cute idea. Yeah, so it's like Zig, the Ziggy cartoon, like <laughs> mom, or you'll see a corner. So you got to look at my Instagram stories. You'll see see those uh, frequently. So Susie's get the support through the caregiver jar. Another thing I discovered is a box called Loved One. And so mom gets a monthly subscription to a box called Loved One from me. And she's so cute. A lot of times we open it together on FaceTime and she walks through everything. And some things are things that Susie can use. Some things aren't. aren't it things, is a very cool gift. It's like themed per the month. Like the last one she just opened was it had a lot of um, fall Halloween things in it. She really looks forward to them. And then calling and texting the primary caregiver regularly. So we have a, a, a group chat. Um, we have a sisters only one. We have a family one. We have a you know you're a caregiver when one. Yeah, those that <laughs> there's a blog post about the things that you know you're a caregiver when for the humor. <laughs> so mentioning the su surprises in the mail, offering weekend respite. So that is something where you know you go on site. And so there was a Labor Day weekend where I went to Pennsylvania and took care of mom so Susie could get away for a bit. Um, and then I'm going up in a couple weeks. Susie's not necessarily leaving anywhere, but having another person there to be the person who's getting the broken sleep at night um, will help. And then we're just better together, frankly. <laughs> we are. And then these are some of the optional tasks you could do. So I had the Amazon Prime account for a while, so I was ordering mom's um, you know, incontinence supplies and things that she needed or whatever Susie needed uh, to, to have that there. I am now... Research, you did a lot of research. I said, I'm looking for this particular lift seat for the toilet. I just delegated. She researched, ordered it, boom, it showed up at the door. That was such a big help. We mentioned the bill paying, vacation planning. So we did mm -hmm. take a vacation with mom, but when her kids uh, graduated high school, we went to the beach. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're you know, researching maybe mm -hmm. the different places that you could go to make that happen, mm -hmm. finding the handi handicap accessible hotels, all of that. So that Keeping you're up with all the holidays, the cards, the birthdays, all those things that mom wants to stay connected with. I was just like, couldn't keep up with getting the card, writing the check, you know, and so you can talk about that. You took over. Yeah, that's, that's, um, we've got a lot of, we, we, we're reproducing where family's growing in size. <laughs> we got a lot of birthdays and a lot of events to remember. And so I have access to mom's, uh, we're trustees on mom's account. So I can, um, you know, shift some money to me, write the check, get the card, send it in the mail. Um, and that's, that's a big help for everybody. So here's how you can prepare to have this family meeting, okay? So organize. My sister's a master at getting organized. Susie, this slide is all you. <laughs> I am. Okay, so there was an overwhelming amount of paperwork, as I'm sure you all know. All these things coming from Humana, Medicare, not only financial, but you are health-wise. You've got financial. So one of my best friends, I used to keep uh, Pendaflex folders in file drawers. I had so many files for everything, and it was great. But it was not portable. It was not portable. And so one of my girlfriends said, here's what you need to do. You need to take those pendiflexes and put them into binders. So I discovered these big four-inch binders. I color-coded. I color-code my kids. I color-code everything. So the properties up at the lake were green. The white were financial. The red is for Tom because he has a chili pepper red car that he absolutely loves. And the black is me. So I tried to break it down by financial health, and then property maintenance. And then within that binder, when you open it up, this is the key, I would get those one through 31 tabs. I would put those in there, and then I would make on the inside of the left cover my table of contents. So there's no rhyme or reason to what's going to be one, two, three, four. Just anything that would start coming in, whether it was mom's podiatrist, that became number one, and I'd write on my a table of contents podiatrist. Uh, number two, we went to the cardiologist. So anyway, when you get anything in the mail then, say um, I would get a bill for the cable, I would open that up, pay it, three-hole punch it, and then go to the, if it was the Mighty Oaks property, I would look at my table of contents, I would look down and see, oh, there's uh, the cable, Comca Comcast cable, that was number five, flip to number five, put it right in there. So, and, th and this might, a lot of you might be digital and do all this online, that's fine, but for us, and I think for when 
our father passed away, it was really hard to find yeah, everything and to pay it all. He had nothing. He was very organized too, though, but he had all the folders and we couldn't quickly they find he never where threw all that anything was. Away. So I, yeah, so I keep all this for if something should happen to me, then there it all is. And it's all in paper form. Nobody needs to know all the passwords to get into everything. And then I try to keep it just for the year. And then what I do is I park this year in a clear plastic bin and I'll mark it 2018. I'll buy two more green, two more white, a uh, red and a black, and I'll start them again for 2019. So if we need to go back in the history, it's there. And I think you need to keep all that for about five years, even for tax purposes. And so then I would, yeah, five years from now, I'll pitch that sixth year. So anyway, that's how I keep organized and it's been a lifesaver. So th there is a lot of passwords. We all have our own passwords that we have to remember and then you, your care recipient has their passwords. And so we do use, um, especially my family, a password app to help manage that. And so you have to remember one password or nowadays with your thumbprint, your fingerprint to get in and you can share it with family members that way. And so there's several out there. Um, and we use one called Keeper, but there's one password and LastPass and some other ones. And then there's something that we discovered recently called a, a legacy drawer from Dave Ramsey where yeah. it really, even for ourselves, to put all of our key papers yeah, in place. Yeah, I'm definitely doing that. So it's uh, you can go to the Dave Ramsey website and just you could just Google Dave Ramsey legacy drawer and it'll tell you. It's literally a box and he tells you exactly what you need, you know, your financial. And it doesn't have to be big. It's um, literally all that critical stuff. Where are your bank accounts? Where are your investment accounts? Where are your insurance? Yeah, we got to look it up online. We got to we yeah, got to yeah. move I'm a little sorry. faster through this, okay. or we're gonna um, miss it, miss some of it. So schedule a meeting. You want to do that next. So in person, if possible, you want to designate a block of time, pick a neutral location, minimize your distractions, identify what to bring and what not to bring, and who not to bring. Who is my <laughs> be just as important? Um, you could do this through a group conference call, of course, and then. I get in advance any topics that people want to talk about. So this is kind of the logistics part of it. Um, these are a lot of questions to help recognize reality. You know, be real about it. Not everybody. It, it, it be, don't worry so much for equality. I think that little green box is the most important thing is just do what makes the most sense. It's not equal right now. She's doing every a lot of everything, and I have got like a chunk of stuff. But you know, you it's it's. But like it's, you said earlier, it's fluid. It's it's changing. I'm asking for help. We're trying to work it out. Exactly. So you have the family meeting. You're going to ask for help, but you use your worksheets um, to help divide and conquer and review all those. Uh, work responsibilities. I think another key thing that's not on those worksheets is that you want to keep your care recipient as independent as possible. It, it, you are going to do things faster than they can do for themselves sometime. And I had to constantly push back on my mom. Frankly, she wanted me to do it, everything for her, be her personal assistant. Frankly, I was like, mom, last I looked, you know, your eyes work well, your fingers work well. I'm pretty sure you can search on Amazon and order that thing yourself. So um, sounds really mean, but that's the reality. They need to k do these things or, um, you know, she could go down and schedule her hair appointment in the assisted living. You know, I didn't have to call and do that for her. That was exercise for her to get to, to do that. And so I think that's important is to keep them doing the things that they can do as long as possible. And then seek your local resources, your support groups, your um, your employee assistance program can do a lot there to help take some burden off of you. They can do research on assisted living centers. They can find doctors for you. They can give you therapy appointments. They could find a grief counselor for your loved one. And so there's a lot of things that you could tap into too. And then arranging carpools, you know, if you're uh, in the sandwich generation with active kids, those other people love those carpools just as much as you do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a win-win situation. And then barter for services. Susie can paint you a painting, and maybe you can do something for her on her caregiving <laughs> I've list. I've actually done that. Yeah. I have bartered a painting for having my steps resurfaced. Yeah. Okay. Communication tips. So you do have to set some ground rules for your family meeting. You want to, you know, in with your care recipients too, don't rehash the past. Um, leave the smartphones at home so that people are focused and solution oriented. You know, really get everything out on the table. Um, 
and discuss how you're going to handle when the big decisions come up. You know, hey, when this happens, we need to have a conference call. Or, and then when to include your care recipient or your married partners and children. Sometimes it's right to have them in the conversations, and sometimes it's not, frankly. So, and then someone's got to kind of be the scribe of what was decided and, you know, take the pictures of things, the responsibilities, so that you know who your point person is. We, I think we talked about this a little bit, is recognizing people's strengths. There's sister power right there. <laughs> Setting up for success. So the binders help with this. So when we're all filling in and pinch hitting, we have the right information in order to do that. Um, I think this is one we have had some practice with <laughs> recently, even so, is, um, you know, my brother in particular, the, the one that can sometimes make things worse, uh, he likes to stir pots, and he likes to do it mostly through text. And so, you know, basically the solution there is that, you know, this isn't a productive conversation, particularly for writing. I'm available at X time if you want to call me and talk about this or, or if we need to have a conference call to talk about it. So, um, you know, he's got a lot of opinions, but not a lot of solutions. <laughs> and then touching base frequently. And so the group text is the one way that we can touch base. We mentioned, you know, the FaceTime, things like that. We've got our, you know, your caregiver um, thread when things come up and we can put some funny stuff in our group text. There's so Tom. that's Tom down there. Who's yeah, that got him walking, got him in the water. Doesn't like to get hot. So I got him in the water to walk. So it's fun to just share pictures too. You know, I think Susie's really good about doing that. Is just here's what my, you know, here's what we're doing today. Um, some of the caregivers that she has coming in to relieve her, they post pictures as well. And to just not just provide updates when there's a crisis. I think we really try to communicate mm -hmm. regularly. When the good times are good too, it's great to share. People want to know she's happy. They want to know, yeah, things like that. And Tom, yep. Share the humor. Share the pictures. So then we just touch base, and so we have the we do our annual uh, retreat weekend together. We all come up to the lake in the summer. We we're all up at the same time then. It's a little bit chaotic, and then we try to come up at some different times with just us. We push each other. So Susie and I set a goal. Uh, the lake's about seven miles long and three miles wide, or no, seven miles wide. Three. Yeah, seven by three, twenty-six miles around. Yeah, and we set a goal that we were going to bike around one summer. So this is us. Doing that one year uh, was fun. We Encouraging had to me to have self-care. I have to be pushed. I tend to, yeah. It's like someone in earlier said, why, do we, are, why are we so careful with administering everything and doing everything for the person we're caring for, but we're not doing it for ourselves? So one thing in those binders I have to mention, the very first thing you open up is, of course, the list of medications. You all know. It's like I have that and I have her... Um, what do they call it? Um, do not care plan. Yeah, do not resuscitate kind of oh, order. Oh, the DNR. Like whatever. D yeah, that's there too. So everywhere I go, I carry copies of that. So yeah. So we yeah we do want to hear from you guys on what tips you have for sharing mm -hmm. the care with your family or questions. We'll we'll answer your questions. Before I do that, did everyone who wanted to sign this binder or this clipboard for the pr the giveaway sign it? Did anyone miss this? Okay, I'm gonna start mm -hmm. it. Maybe we'll just pass it through one more time while we're doing this. So yeah, Vicky. Do you want to take that one? What do you outsource? Where do you get help from other people? Yeah, so I've been lucky. Well, I, I interviewed and found um, people right now because it's 24-7. I'm looking for one shift of eight hours. You obviously are looking for two shifts, right, of eight hours. You're working an eight-hour day. And so, oh, okay. Okay. The bills, you, potentially your sister could, or someone could help with. Are you talking about not using family, just outsourcing? Yeah. yeah. Oh. We had people, like in Atlanta, I had people that um, would come in and be a companion for my mom sometimes, take her to get her uh, flu shot or um, take her to a, a doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, regarding, she's in a facility. I'm thinking we have a house, so we have people that come, and I manage her budget to, do things for the house that are maintenance. Um, trying to give that some thought. If she were in a facility, what would I delegate? I guess what um, are the, the things that you feel like you yeah, need help what's, with? What's taking over your life? Is it the management of her finances? Is it the management of her medicine? 
um, if you could find maybe, yeah, one person like a companion, but what you find is when you use like these uh, organizations that are wonderful, like um, angels, visiting, visiting angels, angels and things like that, you may not always get the same person and you want that one person that knows all the little nuances, right? So, it's more like the house. Like the house, the yard. So she still has a house, but she's in a facility. Right. So you need someone to manage that house, yeah. Sell the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The house is in New Jersey. Yeah. 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 So I think that's what I'm like, the house yep. Yep. We had to sell their house in Florida. That was one of the first things yeah. that we had to do. Um, it was condo. And Actually, we were lucky that in place they did have a couple that when we, they were not at the house in Michigan that would um, check on it and do a lot of the, you know, cleaning the gutters, blowing the leaves, all those things. So. I would suggest just, you know, finding someone who lives near the house. If you decide you want to keep the house and, and find a couple or someone, maybe you could do a barter. Maybe could you, someone could, could you rent the house? Is there's no one living in the house right now? No, there's too much stuff. Yeah. Empty all the stuff and then. Sounds like you might maybe need Maybe your a, sister needs to come out and yeah. you guys have a really fun Declutter. project weekend. Yeah. yeah. Tell her about sister power. Yeah. Declutter it, then you could rent it, and then whoever's renting it, you could give them a trade-off in maintaining the yard, the leaves, the gutters, things like that. You could do. Yeah. What's your question or comment? Actually, a comment. If you go on the internet and search for daily money managers, it's actually a profession. Daily. Daily money managers. Daily money managers. Oh, nice. And you made me think there are these applications called, is it what, Task or uh, TaskRabbit, task Do It. There are these apps where if you just have one task, you can put it out there. I can um, look them up. I, uh, oh, what was it? I had to get a big piece of furniture moved, and I didn't know who to. And so I just put it. They'll give you resources within the zip code of where the house is to get things done. Nextdoor.com. Nextdoor.com? Okay. Tackle. Tackle. Sorry, that's it. T T A K L is the one I used. The other thing is like a, a, a clo there are a lot of closed Facebook groups that are community based. And you can throw something out there and say, I need somebody to do this, and I have friends by mm -hmm. that would draw that I think we skimmed over this a little bit in that, but like, you, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Like, I think a lot of us feel like we've got to be really strong and tough and, hey, I got it, we're fine, this and that. Like, if you're really feeling like you're on the road to burnout, shed the tears, be real about the conversations so that people will step up. Yeah, every community is different. So that's one of the things of the affiliated with the daughterhood.org where we have these circles of support. And I bring my binder with all these local resources in it and people can take pictures of it. But they, we're all sharing ideas right in our own neighborhood. And I think that's really powerful when you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're running out of time. We wanna stay connected with you all. So this is all in your resources as well the different links and things. You can find me at happyhealthycaregiver.com. Look at all of Susie's amazing paintings. I know, that's a good um, collage there. This is my cute dog, Shadow. Um, <laughs> but she's got a blog and a portfolio of stuff. She does commissions for paintings and stuff. So we've got our information up here. 
and then as promised, I um, did everybody sign the clipboard that wanted to. I Can think. I just mention I'm on a panel later this afternoon? Too, oh at yeah, five o'clock. Plug so. your stuff. Yeah, it's a um, about how do. So it's things you did. Do this. How do painting I've and dating and. <laughs> <laughs> while caregiving. Yeah. So it's things you didn't think you could do while caregiving. Yeah. I think it's at five. Five o'clock in the main ballroom. Yes. And then if some of y'all are juggling a side hustle while caregiving and working, then I have another presentation tomorrow. I believe it's at 9 a.m. on uh, how to do that and then what, what works for me. So I'm going to use this app um, to randomize. I've got a list of how many people are in here today that signed this. And we're going to pick for this. So this was something I had a goal by the conference to, to, to have a question of the day journal. It's called Just For You, a daily self-care journal. You can also find that on my website. Um, and so our winner today, oh, it's of course it's my favorite number. Number seven, Diane Levitt? Levitt? What is it? Levitt. Levitt. Diane Levitt. <laughs> awesome. And I think I signed this one. Let me make sure I signed it. Um, and I'd love to get a picture of you afterwards with us. So awesome. Thank you all so much Thank for joining all. today. It went so fast. Thank you.